Hello, and welcome back to Matters Season 2. I'm Jack Newton, Clio's founder and CEO. And I'm Nefra McDonald, Clio's Affinity Partnerships Manager. Matters is brought to you by Clio, the world's leading provider of cloud-based legal software. I can tell you right now, Jack, you're really going to love this episode. That's because we're going to dive into the real difference between lawyer-centered and client-centered law firms. So far on this season of Matters, we've spoken with lawyers, legal consultants, industry trailblazers, scholars, data analysts, and more to begin to highlight the concept of client-centered legal practice. But today, we're ready to play the compare and contrast game and to look at the current model of legal service delivery, which is lawyer-centered. So what's the difference between lawyer-centered and client-centered? And why should you choose the latter for your practice? On this episode, we will hear from industry disruptor Kim Bennett, access to justice advocate Justin Osborne, and legal innovator Aaron Levine about the differences between these two service models. We'll also get their advice for law firm leaders and anyone who wants to improve on the status quo. Up first is Kim Bennett. You might remember Kim from the very first episode of this season. She's the founder of a boutique subscription legal services law firm called K. Bennett Law. She's an innovator, entrepreneur, and business coach who just happens to be a lawyer. Over her career, Kim has worked in many different areas of law. During our interview, she told me that she sees her background in corporate law and her multidisciplinary training as a major advantage that came in handy when she decided to start her own client-centered law firm. Here's Kim. I'll say starting out in corporate, I think, was a big advantage for me. Also having the multidisciplinary training that I have um, was a big advantage. But starting out in corporate, how we practiced was thinking about who our internal clients were. Like that was the key piece here. We worked with a range of industries because we were professional services um, organization. And and it was really important to understand how to be effective, how not to talk a bunch of legalese, how to communicate well, to take that same multidisciplinary approach um, to be efficient in in what we were doing. And we didn't do hourly, right? I didn't start out my career with hourly. So in the corporate environment, it really set the stage for what it looks like to be a team member, to be a part of a multidisciplinary, collaborative, high communicative team. Um, And then when doing like of counsel work, going into coming out of like post-crash is I came out in 07. So the market crashed 08, right? And then coming out after, in a, as of counsel in a firm that was way more traditional. I was like, well, this, this can't be the way we want to still operate. This is how I was operating. It felt more seamless. It felt more like we were a team and collaborative. And so that at that time, I saw a really big shift in how we were showing up for clients. And now running my firm, putting those two together, I said, well, I wanted to run a business that felt more like that collaborative team member approach And I was able to pull what I liked in the different experiences to design what I thought was a better way to show up for clients and also to show up for myself and the team that I was going to eventually build. So that's how I've seen it, at least. We've seen law firms operate from a primarily firm-centered model rather than a client-centered perspective for many years. What are some of the disadvantages this firm-centered model has? I think the biggest disadvantage this has had is in well-being and not just like well-being of the practitioner, but of like everyone. Like we failed clients in serving their needs. We failed uh, legal professionals and we can see in the unhealthy stats that come out of it. And, you know, as an industry, we fail to just do what our real bigger calling is, is to like solve for justice, solve for these bigger issues, systemic and structural issues that listen, we're in the middle of watching them still happen. And as a legal industry, we have to say to ourselves, well, what's our role in this? And how has our past structure contributed to where we are today? And so for me, I think at its core, if we cared about well-being more, we would see better structures for those that are practicing, better structures for those that are needing the services and better impact on society and the community as a whole. Do you feel like there's a light bulb moment that happens when you're talking to lawyers that work at a law firm that is more firm centered in terms of when they realize that there's a better way and why this, what is a pretty massive paradigm shift could, could actually be really empowering both for, for them and their clients. Yeah. I think it happens with individual lawyers more because I do, when I speak to 
larger organizations or larger firms that are looking to move towards my model, you see a lot of pushback. Well, how's that going to work? And clients won't like it. And, but then when there's that one attorney or that one legal professional, some, that one legal professional, whatever you are on the team, that one legal professional that like sees it, then they start seeing, oh, I could operate like this. I could bring this, this piece of me in. I could really show up in all these interesting ways. Um, how we thought about what our legal services shifts and changes and like the impact that can be created expands. And so I just think it unlocks so much opportunity and there is this light bulb, but I will say I'm still seeing more like individual light bulbs versus like across the board in like an organizational light bulb. But when you see an organization have that light bulb moment, then it, then it's a major shift. But if I say organizationally where I see that shift, it's the small, this, you know, small firms where you'll see that because it's a few people that are running it and then they see that and then they'll make that shift and they'll see their operations change, their team shift and how they show up. They'll see their money change, like all of those things. It's interesting that we see large amounts of inertia with larger firms and we see that on the technology front and obviously see it even on the mindset front in terms of what it takes to to get some of these these mindset shifts across the the finish line in in terms of where the industry is headed why does the law firm centered model need to change or maybe put more bluntly why does it need to die yeah it does need to die <laughs> um it's unhealthy. I mean, I go back going back to well-being. I mean, thinking about centering and I the law the law firm centered model centered lawyers. Like it didn't even center the entire team. It centered lawyers. And that led to where we are today. And the stats, the unhealthy well-being stats show it. But more importantly, I think it just not even more importantly, in addition to that, we have seen that the needs of our society and the way that we can show up to create change, the knowledge that we hold is there's too many gaps. And that old model allowed for those gaps to maintain. And so if we really want to build an industry that is going to be responsive to today's needs and the future needs, we have to let go of what got us here that still actually didn't quite work. Because if we actually were moving the needle more, we wouldn't see 70% of needs unmet. We wouldn't see high, unfortunate, you know, rates of like, you know, substance abuse or suicide, we wouldn't see those things, right? We wouldn't see, you know, women leaving, leaving the profession more or not getting part the, the systemic issues are as a result of the model that we had. And so now it's time to change that model, respond to where we all are as a society and design better and move to a model that actually thinks about the full, the full spectrum and understands that the client experience is so key and that, and that also means that the experience of those that you're working with are just as important as well. Okay, we need to back up a bit to what she said in the middle there. We know the lawyer-centered approach is missing the mark when it comes to client needs, satisfaction, and changing attitudes toward service models. But something we haven't yet talked about is the negative impact that lawyer-centered practice has on lawyers themselves. You're right, Nefra. In fact, in Clio's 2018 Legal Trends Report, we found that three quarters of lawyers surveyed said they're frequently or always working outside of regular business hours, and almost 40% said long hours negatively affect their personal lives. And like Kim said, being overworked and unwell can often lead to substance abuse problems, depression and anxiety, and burnout. And many lawyers, especially women, are leaving the profession altogether. This shows how clinging to this outdated model isn't helping anyone. I want to be clear, too, that when we say lawyer-centered model, this doesn't mean that the lawyer's best interests and well-being are being prioritized in this system. Rather, the firm's bottom line is the main thing taken into account at the expense of both the firm's staff and its clients. It's really a firm-centered model. So, Jack, how should firms balance the needs of lawyers and clients once they move to a client-centered approach? I asked that question to Aaron Levine, founder of Levine Family Law Group, and also the successful do-it-yourself online divorce platform, Hello Divorce. Here's what Aaron had to say. It's hard for me to distinguish because I've always tried to blend the two. I think as a firm administrator, you want to ensure that your lawyers feel safe, comfortable, are earning enough money, 
have enough flexibility to be able to watch their daughter's soccer game or go to a medical appointment, but at the same time, really focus on exactly what the consumer needs. And the best way to do that, I've found, is to collect data on both sides, to continue to collect data from the consumers about what their experience was like or is like as they're walking through their legal issue um, during and after, and then also to remain incredibly connected to your team, giving them an opportunity to not just provide feedback as a group, but separately and to share what their needs and goals are. And sometimes they don't even know that because they're working so hard, they haven't stopped to think about what they need, which is an amazing opportunity for lawyers and law firms to bring in an executive coach or somebody to help with wellness or additional training to help people access whether or not a different practice area might work better for them or whether mediation could be a supplement to a type of practicing law that causes burnout or too much stress or whatever it might be. I think one of the most interesting things about your hello divorce model, Aaron, is that it proves out that you can be client centered and you can you can increase access to justice without compromising the lawyer's profitability, their outcome, their their well being. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how you see being client centered going hand in hand with actually creating a good environment for your lawyers? I I definitely think that being client centric was probably the biggest shift we've ever made as a law firm. It felt really foreign to everyone, including me. We also had to help redefine what as lawyers we felt success was because what we learned is it's very different from what a client necessarily believes is success. And in doing that and learning more about what the client needed and prioritized, it also helped take some pressure off of us. So one example is, you know, we would always strive for the most amount of child support that we could get for a client. Like we didn't feel like we did a value to our client or that we were successful unless we got that extra $50 a month. And quite frankly, they were paying us so much money in our full representation capacity that we felt like we had to get that. But the pressure is off a little bit when the client knows and buys into the brand that that $50 or that $25 extra a month, what would that be the, what would be the cost? of getting that? How might that destroy our relationship that we're going to need to continue well beyond this divorce as we co-parent into our next chapter? So I think there's a big transition there in terms of, of how you lawyer. And once our lawyers were able to see that really it's less about getting the absolute best legal result and more about helping people navigate the system and the legal issues so that they could craft an agreement that actually works for them, it became a complete win-win situation. Clients feeling like they could move forward, that they felt comfortable with the agreement, that conflict is inevitable, but that doesn't mean war. And lawyers being able to literally just jump in when a client needs them, guide them through. And we like to feel needed. So being able to help them with something relatively quickly and having that client feel positive about their experience is a wonderful way to practice. So contrary to popular belief, Most people don't want a long, messy, super expensive divorce. They are looking for us to tell them that there's another way. And they also, if you ask people what their biggest fear is, they will tell you a long, messy, ugly divorce. And so we see on the media, the three to 5% divorces modeled that are messy, that are ugly, where someone is actually a narcissist. But for the most part, 
human beings just want to move through this as quickly and efficiently as possible so that they can move on to their next chapter. They don't want to throw their ex under the bus. So in terms of has it been hard to get clients and consumers to buy into a way of resolving conflict that doesn't involve winning or losing, that isn't a zero sum game, that hasn't been the hard part. What was the hard part early on was convincing consumers that there is a viable alternative to the lawyer up and fight status quo. And that was a really challenging hurdle for me early on. And then COVID hit and everyone turned online anyhow. And so it's been one of the, the only magic wands we've had throughout this entire startup journey is COVID-19 hit and people just assumed that a established online legal service or provider could really help them with their needs. Yeah, what I, what I hear you saying that's so interesting here about the lawyer-centric versus client-centric perspective in in divorce and then the way you've reframed it with with hello divorce in particular Aaron is rethinking what does winning look like you know and 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 what's the positive outcome of this look like and i think in many ways the traditional lawyer centric perspective is winning is getting your pound of flesh and getting the maximum settlement and maybe you know leaving the the relationship in a really broken place as a result but at least you at least you won, and 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 I think you're thinking about it in truly a a client centric way. That is thinking about that long term positive out, outcome for the client with, with a pretty empathetic view, and and maybe the even the knowledge thanks to doing hundreds or thousands of these around what success looks like and how you can actually create a positive long term outcome for your client. Yeah, I agree. I think that when you're charging. $500, $600 an hour, there's an expectation that you will win. And that win looks like a better result in court by whatever means. So I think we're really tying ourselves to an unattainable standard, one that is certainly not client centric by continuing and perpetuating this idea that the only way to win is to get more custodial time in a family law matter or more child support or spousal support. We have to look at things more holistic and we have to manage clients' expectations better. If they want the cost to go down, if they want to have more participation in their legal matter, then they need to understand that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Seriously, Jack, we might have to give Erin her own podcast. She has so much wisdom to share, and she's right. Moving away from an unattainable standard and toward a holistic approach centered around client needs and expectations is a win-win for clients and lawyers. I agree. Erin is incredible, and maybe she should host Matters Season 3. And I like what she said about moving away from the lawyer up and fight approach. Because although it's a great model for high billable hours, it's not actually working for real clients who are navigating tough legal problems such as divorce. But this seems to be one of the biggest hurdles for a law firm to clear in order to transition to a client-centered model. The billable hour and the client's best interests often seem like they're placed at opposite ends of this tug of war. You know, that struggle is something that came up often in my conversation with Justin Osborne. Justin's law firm, Council Carolina, handles personal injury and trial law cases from an office in Raleigh, North Carolina. But Justin and his colleagues also drive around in a custom-fitted RV to offer much-needed pro bono legal services to their community. Hold up. Did you just say custom-fitted RV? Yes, I did, Nefra. Here's more on that and my chat with Justin. So Justin, you've been an advocate for making justice accessible your entire career. Have you encountered friction at law firms as a result of that? Can you give some specific examples? Um, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd probably describe it as either cynicism uh, or apathy. You know, I think a, a large majority of professionals that at least I've worked with don't really see there being a problem of access to justice. I mean, you know, there's always a joke about there are just so many lawyers in the world. How are these people not able to find one? Or, or they think, you know, what my firm is doing, you know, specifically something interesting like an RV to go to underserved communities 
Uh, they think that this, you know, is somehow a disservice to the status and tradition and maybe nobleness of the profession. So we've gotten a little bit of that feedback so far, um, but we, we've also gotten things just that I, I would describe as apathy. It's, they, they know there's a problem. They know that, you know, there are groups of people that need more help, but just don't think it's compatible with their practice or think it's beneath them. You know, this is what young associates do or, or folks like, uh, you know, at Legal Aid, that's what they're really, uh, you know, meant to be working on. Um, and so we, we, we see both, but I, I'd probably say apathy is, is more of what we've seen uh, through our career and through, through starting this firm. Justin, what are some of the specific ways you've seen law firms act in ways that are not in their clients' best interests? Yeah, and, and having lived on both sides of the coin, at least for, for injury cases, uh, I've absolutely seen it. Um, you know, on the, the defense side, which is how I was brought up in my career, uh, the, the billable hour is still king. And I have absolutely been at defense firms where I've seen where even getting good results is, is secondary you know, to case billing. Um, and I remember I had a partner who would famously say, if you came back from mediation and the case didn't settle, well, the, the bad news is the case didn't settle, but the good news is the case didn't settle. So you know, that, that mentality is, uh, is definitely pervasive. And, and there's always a question about, you know, is it still in the client's best interest to be moving forward? Is it in their best interest to have a you know, scorched earth mentality on these cases? And, and I could say in a lot of instances, I don't think it was in their best interest, but, but that was the direction the, you know, the law firm took. Now, on the, on the plaintiff side, it, you, know, you, you still see it, the, the motivations are different, but you still see it. And I think the question that comes up a lot is, it's not just a question about, is it a good case or can you prove what you need to to make money? But especially now that our firm has, has been able to represent victims of sexual assault in civil cases, the question we're asking more is, you know, is this person a good candidate to deal with, you know, the psychological weight and difficulties of litigation? Um, do they have a support system? Do they have resources to help them through the process? Because in, inevitably, you're going to get asked the question, do you think I should, I should do this? Do you think I should, um, you know, take on this type of lawsuit? And I think you have to be able to be honest with them and say, I'm worried about you, or I don't know that this is going to be good for you. And I know a lot of you know, plaintiff's lawyers sort of do some hand waving and say to every client, you know, going to trial is hell, this is going to be difficult, et cetera. But uh, I don't know that that's enough of a disclaimer for, for some of the, the people that we meet um, who are usually victims of a pretty bad circumstances. So even if the firm is winning the client's case or handling the client's matter appropriately, are there other ways the firm might be falling short in terms of really servicing the client's needs over the entirety of their client journey? I, I think so. You know, I, I think there's a big question between, you know, case outcome um, and, and what's best for a client. And, and those are not always, sometimes you think that they may be the same, but they're not always the same. Um, you know, we, we saw this a lot with COVID, uh, with courts being closed. Uh, you know, we may have cases that are worth a certain amount of money. And, and for whatever reason, that money is not on the table. And you have clients who are in desperate need of funds um, who, you know, or just feel the, the weight of litigation and want it to be over with. And that is directly at odds with what we want, is to, which is to make the most money possible and get them the biggest number possible. And, and that's where, you know, case outcome for us or a good outcome, it really needs to be based on is the client happy with what has happened or is the client satisfied? Um, not necessarily what, what is the biggest number we could put on a billboard if we had sort of all the resources in the world or all the time in the world, you know, we get used to the pressures of litigation, but, but most regular people don't like it. And, and even if it's not really on their day-to-day -day radar, it's something that affects and bothers them. And, and we have to be mindful of that to, to make sure that um, what they're getting out of it is not just an outcome, but also a good experience. Are there other ways you, you touched on the fact that you know, maybe focusing on, on billables and, and even focusing on, on the outcome can be, a bit of a, a firm centric, a lawyer centric way of thinking about the the case. Are, are there other ways you think that that law firms are entrenched in this this lawyer centric way of of thinking? That's been the traditional focus of of how a lot of firms operate. You know, you you end up seeing a little bit of an uh, of an us versus them mentality, even with with your own clients. Um, you know, clients are, ex you know, expectedly nervous about the process. A lot of them require handholding. Sometimes you have to tell them the same thing you've told them time and time and time again. Um, and, and it's something you have to fight against. But this mentality of like the client 
is an impediment to what we want to do. Um, and, and, and with that, that, that is where you, if you focus on the client, the client's journey, the client um, uh, obtaining an outcome that is best for them, as opposed to what you think is the best outcome for the case, um, you tend to have a little bit more patience with them, a little more patience for the handholding and things that, that are needed uh, j- just to make a person feel good about what is happening and feel good with the outcome. Even if you know in your heart of hearts, maybe you could have you know, gotten a better result or, or something else. You know, a, a satisfied client really should be the uh, the main goal. If we flip it around, Justin, and, and think instead about some of the advantages for adopting a more client centered model, can can you walk through how this can benefit not only the client but the firm as well? Sure. I, I think first and foremost, as a lawyer and even as a business owner, it, it makes your life easier. Um, you know, bad reviews, bar complaints, fee disputes. In my experience, those are really all symptoms of a bad client experience. Uh, I mean, we, we have personally had clients that have had to swallow very bitter pills during the course of litigation, I have not been happy with the outcome. Uh, but by focusing on really, you know, making sure they were comfortable and at ease during the whole process, um, you know, their, uh, their concerns were met and we were always available you know, they were still satisfied with, with the end, even if the, the number or, or whatever else wasn't what they had hoped for. You can avoid a lot of those, those difficult things to deal with, like bar complaints, bad reviews. I think by focusing more on is the client happy and satisfied with the process versus I'm going to get X result for them. And then for us, uh, we have found that it, it leads to repeat business. You know, we've learned this, you know, from, from the legal trends research that Cleo's put out, but for most people, if they have a lawyer they've met with before and had a positive interaction, that's the first lawyer they call when something new comes up. You know, so we think a good outcome or what we're most proud of is when, you know, we do an estate plan for mom and dad and then help junior get out of a speeding ticket. And then the neighbor calls who's been in a rear end wreck because they've, they've heard good things about us and, and may not know if we even do this kind of work. Um, so, so that it, it can also be profitable to focus on making sure there is good customer experience versus just good outcomes. And Justin, how would you encourage law firm leaders to think differently about the way they view their clients and their clients' experiences? I think that it's trending this way, but, but realizing that we, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're service providers. Um, and I think the public uh, is starting to see us more as that and expect more from us. And you're seeing it in other industries you know, you go to your dentist office now and it's, it's concierge treatment with drinks and mounted TVs to watch and, and things that would have been unheard of when I was a kid. And, and I think, you know, some of that is a little superficial, but I, I do think we, we should have a similar mindset of how we can make processes easier. We can leverage technology and also be mindful of, of individuals who, who don't like technology, but, but still want an easy, transparent process uh, to, to work through litigation or whatever, uh, I guess, whatever the legal process is. So, you know, we we are trying to be mindful of our client's point of view when we develop systems uh, and things just to make sure that what we're doing isn't just easy for us, but it's also easy for them. That interview was packed with great advice. Make the process easier for clients and lawyers. Create more transparent processes. Leverage tech. Justin really hits the nail on the head. I love when our guests are able to easily sum up the main point here. And Justin does just that. Law firms need to think differently and be mindful of their client's point of view. So Jack, we've heard from three incredibly talented industry disruptors. Now that we're at the end of this episode, what's sticking with you? What are you taking away from these conversations on being lawyer-centered versus client-centered? I think Erin Levine encapsulates my main takeaway earlier in the episode when she said that client-centered lawyering is really a win-win for the client and the lawyer. It offers lawyers more flexibility and comfort, and it gives clients the support and service they want, and frankly, deserve. The current model isn't working for anyone but the firm. That's really where big change needs to happen, at the firm level. It's up to law firm leaders to start thinking differently about their clients' experiences, and in turn, the experiences of their own staff. Because a collaborative, client-centered approach is the model that will allow firms to market themselves and adapt more effectively in the digital economy, as opposed to an outdated model that prizes the billable hour above all else. That's really the core of it, Jack. And it leads us directly to the question we'll answer in our next episode. 
what does the shift to client-centered practice actually look like for law firms in real time? I can't wait, Nefra. Before we go, I wanted to say a big thank you to all of our listeners for helping to make Matters Season 2 a success. Thank you for everyone who's shared an episode or sent us feedback and questions. Keep them coming. Thanks, Jack. This has been a presentation of Season 2 of Matters, based on the client-centered law firm, the best-selling book by Jack Newton. Matters is hosted by Jack Newton and Nefra McDonald, produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and brought to you by Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider. Be sure to subscribe to Matters wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit us at clio.com. To read Jack's book, search for The Client-Centered Law Firm wherever you buy your books.